Hey everybody, it's Vanessa. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, I am a psychic medium. If you are not new here, welcome back. I hope you guys are all doing well. Today in this video, I wanted to try to up my content and do something a little bit different. Um, I am going to be talking about the Cecil Hotel. Um, I really wanted to talk about the Cecil Hotel because I, as you know, obviously being a psychic medium, ooky spooky, paranormal, true crime type content is very interesting to me. So I wanted to talk about the Cecil Hotel. There is a lot of dark history surrounding the hotel, multiple deaths. There's even a serial killer that has been walking about the grounds of the Cecil Hotel. So I found it very interesting and I want to share that content with you guys today. If you are into that, please stay tuned for this video and here we go. The Cecil Hotel is now known as the Stay on Main, but when it started construction in 1924, the Cecil architect was L.L. Smith and it was constructed by the Weymouth Crow Company. The Cecil was built on the site of a home that had later been converted into a chicken farm slash pet store called Fancier's Exchange. The chicken store stayed in business until about the 1920s before the property was sold to W.W. Patton and Associates for a new hotel. The Cecil was led by hotelier William Banks Hanner. It was supposed to be a destination hotel for the international businessmen and social elites, but it's been quite the opposite. It's housed serial killers and been involved in 16, yes, one, six, 16 suspicious deaths and suicides. The total investments for this hotel was about a million dollars, which in today's exchange would be the equivalent of about 20 million. The hotel was beautiful. It featured 19 stories, over 700 rooms, a spacious lobby, a basement. Uh, it was a very art style hotel, complete with uh, marble everywhere, stained glass windows, palm trees, a beautiful opulent staircase. The Cecil easily could have been like the Hotel Bel Air, which was built in 1946, or the Chateau Marmont, which was also built in uh, 1929. The hotel was very profitable for the first few years of its existence, but in 1929, America fell into a Great Depression, leaving some jobless or homeless or even hopeless. This would lead to many tragic events that followed, which would change the perspective of the Cecil Hotel forever. The hotel opened on December 20th, 1924 but no one could have really ever imagined the economic decline of the 1930s. And while in the beginning they had hoped to bring the upper class of society on vacation, the reality is that no one had the money for vacations and the Cecil still had to pay their bills somehow. And until the hospitality industry bounced back, that led them into having to lower their nightly rates and offer monthly stay options. And after the beginning of the Great Depression, the Cecil found itself in a very awkward place. Skid Row was just beginning to form, and as we know today, that would only continue to get worse on that side of town. And the Cecil had to face facts that they had to lower their rates and offer those monthly pricings just to stay afloat. And through the 1930s, that would leave such a dark, unimaginable imprint of trauma onto the site of the Cecil Hotel. And by 1927, rooms with a shared bath cost $1.50 a night. Rooms with a private toilet cost $2 a night. And rooms with a private complete full bath cost only $2.50 a night. Unfortunately, the good times really would not last long at all. And by the post-depression era, the hotel was turned into almost an entirely budget motel offering affordable short-term housing. The proximity of the Cecil Hotel to Skid Row is undeniably one of the reasons why the hotel was never really able to reach its pinnacle as a luxury hotel. Skid Row is a 54 block area that houses thousands of homeless in the Los Angeles area. The first murder at the Cecil is still unsolved and it's often actually referred to on the suicide list that I just read a moment ago. And that's really based on the murky details of the case. Now, the police originally believed that it was a suicide of 25-year-old Grace E. McGrow, but later had said that she either jumped or had fallen to her death from the Cecil's ninth floor. Now, her 
story was the one where the body had fallen onto the power lines and didn't break her fall. She was taken from the scene to the hospital where she did succumb to her injuries. Now, there was an article that stated that her boyfriend, who was a sailor, his name was M.W. Madison, was staying at the Cecil Hotel with Grace. Now, he claims that he was sleeping at the time and had no idea what had happened. And if Grace was struggling with suicidal thoughts or going through a depression, then he would have known something. There were no leads to the case, and that caused it to go cold and still to this day remains unsolved. The next murder would take place on June 4th of 1964, where hotel workers would discover the body of Goldie Osgood. Goldie was a retired telephone operator. Goldie had been raped, stabbed, and beaten, and her room was completely ransacked. Goldie was well known around the area, and she had actually earned the nickname Pigeon because she would feed birds in a nearby Pershing Square. Near Goldie's body, they found a Los Angeles Dodgers cap that she would always wear and a paper sack that was full of birdseed. Now, the police did suspect one person and did later arrest him, and his name was J.B. Ellinger. And they did find Ellinger walking around that same Pershing Square wearing bloodied clothes. They did arrest him and charge him with the murder, but however, they did let him go because there was really no substantial evidence to support the allegations that he murdered Goldie. The most notorious customer in the early days of the Cecil was a young, beautiful actress named Elizabeth Short. Elizabeth was determined to make it onto the big screen, and she had just arrived from Hyde Park, Boston. At the time, the Cecil Hotel was extremely popular and opulent. The bar was always full, and Short was spotted there the night before she disappeared. She had just arrived from a trip with her boyfriend to San Diego on January 9th and there were a few confirmed sightings of Elizabeth on that evening, but she wouldn't be seen again until January 15th, when a mother was walking with her baby in a stroller, and she looked upon an abandoned parking lot in Lamont Park, and she thought that she had spotted a store mannequin. But when the woman got a little bit closer to get a better look, she actually stumbled upon the butchered remains of Elizabeth, better known as the Black Dahlia by the media. Elizabeth's murder was anything but routine. She had been killed by someone who possibly had training as a doctor. She was cut in half before she was moved to that abandoned parking lot. Elizabeth's body was riddled with trauma, but one of the most disturbing elements is that the assailant had actually carved into Elizabeth's face post-mortem and had carved her into a smile. The police at one point had over 150 suspects, but the case ended up going cold. Elizabeth was actually rumored to be a prostitute and there was another rumor that her attacker was never caught because the crime was being covered up by the LAPD. The medical training needed for some of these cuts made it really clear that the assailant definitely knew what he was doing. It was someone who truly knew human anatomy as well as medical practices that were being done at the time. The body was cut completely in half by a technique that was taught in the 1930s. The lower half of the body had been removed by transecting the lumbar spine between the second and third lumbar vertebrae. This was someone who truly knew human anatomy, and this does still remain unsolved to this day. Former LAPD detective Steve Hodel believes he knows who killed Elizabeth and believes it was his own father. He spent over 15 years trying to prove this theory after his dad died. Steve was going through his father's things and found some very disturbing pictures that looked just like Elizabeth, among some uncanny coincidences that seemed to tie George Hodel, PhD, to Elizabeth's murder. Conflicting stories say Elizabeth was a guest, but there was a book on the Cecil that says that she was an avid customer at the bar, but Elizabeth never actually stayed at the Cecil as a guest. There was also reports that say due to her occupation as a prostitute, Elizabeth actually did not have a place of her own and frequented bars in the area, hoping to get a gentleman caller that she could stay the night with. Possibly one of the most famous Cecil guests was Richard Ramirez, aka the Night Stalker. Richard Ramirez lived in the Cecil Hotel during the height of his crimes as the Night Stalker. It's unclear whether he actually killed anyone at the Cecil or if it was just a safe place for him to lay his head at night. 
Ramirez lived on the 14th floor and would actually be seen by residents discarding his bloody clothes outside, and then he would walk in his bloody, tidy whitey underwear and nothing else all the way up to the 14th floor. As far as we know, the Night Stalker never brought any of his victims back to the hotel. It's simply just a place for him to safely return at night after committing these murders. On at least one occasion, he had actually removed someone's eyeballs and kept them as human trophy. And then after committing some of these most brutal murders that happened all over Southern California, he would just come back home to the Cecil. One former Cecil resident described the hotel at the time as completely lawless. It was so chaotic that serial killers felt comfortable calling it home. On August 30th of 1985, a group of residents in Los Angeles actually spotted him in the street and prevented him from leaving until the police were able to arrive and arrest him. In 1989, Ramirez was convicted of 13 murders and sentenced to death by the gas chamber. He would actually die from cancer in 2013 while awaiting his fate on death row. Richard Ramirez would not be the only serial killer to take up residence in the Cecil Hotel. Jack Unterweger, an Australian journalist, stayed at the Cecil while on assignment in America. Jack found celebrity of sorts through his writing. He wrote a book in prison called Purgatory or the Trip to Prison, Report of a Guilty Man. Jack was completely pardoned for killing a woman after 15 years and the release of his book. The decision on the behalf of the Austrian government would prove to be a deadly one. Months after his release and after arriving and checking into the Cecil Hotel, Jack would go on a murder spree, killing three women back to back in June 1991. Jack proclaimed his innocence all the way up to his trial in 1994. Jack did commit suicide by hanging himself in his jail cell. Shortly after his verdict came back as guilty for the murders of Shannon Exley, who was 35, Irene Rodriguez, who was 33, and Peggy Jean Booth, who was only 26, the Austrian government literally pardoned this man. They pardoned him because he was an excellent writer, but I still don't see why he wasn't put on some sort of watch list. Instead, he was given a press badge, a plane ticket, and an all-expense-paid visit to sunny Los Angeles and checked into the Cecil Hotel. The most recent murder was the one of Elisa Lamb, who was 21-year-old Canadian student visiting California at the time of her disappearance in 2013. She was reported missing and then sadly found in the hotel's water tank 19 days later after residents had called and complained that their water was having a very funny taste or color. The water tanks don't make too much sense though because the Cecil Hotel was connected to city water, making these tanks kind of useless unless they were used to house hot water, which is very doubtful because then Elisa would have significant burns all over her body if not killed by heat. One of the most odd parts about Elisa's case was the footage of her on an elevator at the Cecil right before she disappeared. She appeared to be somewhat frightened and seemed like she could have been possibly running from something or someone. It's been said that she could have possibly been playing a game called the elevator game. And it seems like a very complex game that if you can get through all these steps without being stopped, with no one entering the elevator, you'll be transported to another dimension, apparently. As with most cases at the Cecil, it still remains unsolved to this day. After being found in the tank, which was only eight foot by four foot in diameter, workers had to cut the water drum open to even get her body out, which really leads to the question of how she even got on the roof in the first place how she was able to remove the lid, and not only was she able to get into the water tank, but then closing the top of the lid and trapping herself inside. It's very odd. There was a Mexican death metal musician. His name was Pablo Vergara, and he was questioned in connection to the disappearance, but it was determined early on that he was in Mexico when she had disappeared. Amateur sleuths stumbled upon some odd videos 
thinking there may be more that meets the eye than is seen, but it seems quite the opposite in the case of Pablo. Again, this case remains to be unsolved. So as of 2022, like I said earlier, the Cecil Hotel isn't even a hotel anymore. It's actually completely changed its name to the Stay on Main. I do know that the Ghost Adventures crew actually went there to do an overnight investigation to see what sort of evidence or paranormal phenomenon that they could pick up there. I remember vaguely watching that episode. I don't recall all the details, but I personally, as a psychic medium, would absolutely love to go to a destination like the Cecil Hotel, also known as the Stay on Main, and see what I could pick up or what I would see or what sort of energies or spirits would be drawn to me uh, or, or honestly anything that I could really see um, at the hotel or around the grounds or the building, you know, so on and so forth. Um, I really hope that you guys did like this video. I know that it was a little bit of a long one. I hope you guys stay tuned and watch the whole thing. Please let me know down below what your favorite part was, what questions you have, what kind of content would you like for me to do next? I always love to hear your guys' opinions and your theories and all your different ideas of who, what, where, when, and why, and who did what. So, all right, guys, thank you for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a great day. Bye.